congratulations for being here because the best organizations really are committed to growth. Um, and not just a one, you know, there are one time major lift growth projects that if you really do want to do something um, major, you kind of have to dig in more and um, business plan around it. But in general, the best organizations are growth oriented, always looking for how can we um, grow and extend our impact and do what we do better. Um, and growth can be many things. It doesn't always have to be um, growing your markets. Um, it can be going deeper. You know, really, are we if we're saying that we do these things and we're getting these great outcomes, but we're really only doing a fraction of them, do we need to extend our um, reach or our impact or enhance our process from a theory of change or a, um, an outcomes orientation? Um, Another thing to note is I, although I'm kind of entrepreneurial and business oriented, that sometimes this idea of starting new um, businesses or opportunities can also um, be, uh, have risk alongside them, along with, as you really look at your core mission, um, you know, is this an extension of our core mission or is this sort of an ancillary effort? to just generate income. And many, many of you may not have that problem because some nonprofits just rarely ever have an income generating opportunity. But if, if it is, the best ones are ones where it, it does really also tie to your core mission. And of course, leadership matters. Your reputation to the extent you've gained and earned and worked hard to gain re uh, relationships and reputations and donors and supporters, they're the ones that will come alongside you and and be your seed capital, be your growth capital when there really isn't um, that either because you don't have money in the bank. Um, of course, you can have a strategy to, to try to secure and grow some growth capital, but uh, they're the ones that will help fuel that. And, you know, not being too biased, but I do believe that, you know, planning for growth increases your probability of success and your ability to hit it um, and to do it uh, in a, at a faster or the, the, the pace that makes sense and investment capital can fuel that growth. So what we're gonna talk about today is really, we're gonna start by um, grounding um, ourselves in core strategy. What I see a lot of times is organizations sometimes pursuing initiatives and opportunities uh, just, um, you know, for lack of a better term, opportunistically, um, either because a grant comes their way or um, they see they see something, but really um, a good growth opportunity is grounded in really under, understanding who you are, what um, what your core business model is, your mission, um, your strengths, your competitive advantage, and then moves to how you can pursue scaling uh, based on um, also an understanding of your um, your mission versus money. Where are there opportunities that are um, that are uh, easier to scale because you do maybe cover a lot of your costs versus others that are just mission central, but they're ones that you really uh, have to have to go to the board every year. I remember Kathy Colbinson once from Chris 180 talking about her mission versus money and her business model and saying, you know, this group home model is going away. This is what we were founded on, but board, if you want to continue to do this, you board and, you know, our private uh, donors have to be the ones to fund it because government will, will no longer fund it. Um, so that's just an example. And then we're gonna we're gonna look at our um, a tool that I developed. I worked with the, the Community Foundation for Northeast Georgia, Randy Redner. Some of you may know Randy and how ambitious he is. And he's like, nonprofits, you, you know, our needs are exploding. You need to get ready to scale. And so I developed a tool that I used in a workshop with um, the community foundation out there called the readiness for scaling, and then we'll do Q and A. So I'm gonna just stop for a minute and I'm gonna um, kind of engage some of you. And, you know, if you can maybe type this into the chat or, you know, a couple of you, um, you know, we, I, we probably don't have a lot of time for talk, but I'm gonna ask you to say, you know, if you, th this is the sort of high level, high level, um, breakdown of how to think about readiness for scale. One is, you know, one of you mentioned earlier, a need, uh, there's great demand and need, you know, clearly a market need and a demand. Um, but that hopefully intersected with the fact that you 
have some proof or some evidence that you can do that work well. Um, sometimes it has to be a pilot and you have to prove it first and, and then go out and get, um, re you know, get readiness for scale. So it's not always that way, but usually uh, you don't go through a giant effort until you have some proof that you can get impact that you can take to a donor who will fund your growth. Um, you also um, need to have the staff and organizational capabilities and, and commitment and to wanting to grow and to doing the hard work that it takes um, enthusiasm and motivation, um, and then a revenue model, um, donors and others that uh, will either support that initial growth and equally importantly, that you have a, a, some amount of confidence that you can grow, grow the sustainable revenue, revenue model. So a, a quick poll here on a scale of one to five with one being not ready at all, <laughs> three being somewhere in the middle and five, like we really have, feel like we're we're ready to go. Um, what? Where are your organizations? And you know, have multiple people on the same organization can have different perspectives. So, um, if you want to send in your your rating, um, I'd be interested to see what we have here. Okay, we got a three point five. Is everybody uh, having a chance to? We got a four, okay. Anybody have a five on this call? I'm gonna speak up. Okay, two to four, depends on the program. Okay, well, we're. it looks like we're on average somewhere in the middle. I would just ask you to kind of keep that in mind as we just go through this process, see if, if it adjusts along the way at all. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Um, really, when I talk about strategy and understanding your identity and your core, it's really not um, yet the detailed plan. It's, it's um, kind of a, a broad formula that defines your, your your mission, vision, and how you go about that work. So this comes from Bridgepan. Um, I didn't invent this, these nice, pretty slides. They have a lot of <laughs> very expensive people <laughs> that do graphics. Um, but the, we had a leadership strategy program that GCN did in partnership with Bridgepan that was funded by some major foundations that believe that, you know, we really do want the, not only the organization, but the leadership team to, um, to come together for good strategy and good leadership development. So this was part of a program, but really at the end of the day, um, not good nonprofits need to ask themselves, what are we trying to accomplish? And you know, what is our theory of change to get there? Um, and sometimes you kind of start with programs and you work your way back, <laughs> but ideally this should come first, you know, really what does success look like short, mid and, and long-term? And then what are the right, programs, services, and, and um, approach to how we can get those outcomes and impacts. And then what then um, are the skills, staffing systems, structures, um, economics, and such that can drive good performance? So, um, you know, this, so in other words, um, you, you know, you might have a great idea of a need, but, you know, um, how does that get put into like a, a program that we can operate with fidelity or with success in a different geography or a, an extension of a program? How does that um, lev leverage our existing capabilities? We might have a warehouse, we might have a van, we might have, you know, really skilled um, superstar um, who really knows the space of, let's say, for Inspiritus, they had the superstar that really knew disaster relief very well. And they were in a couple markets. They knew that that person's skill set, experience, reputation was a key asset. Um, and then, what's the economic model um, that we think? Who are the, you know, what are the a handful? Ideally, you know, there's this idea that we have diversified funding, and that is important to an extent. But there's also kind of what's our major funding model? Are we you know, are we cure childhood cancer where we know we can appeal to a 
wild, uh, a wide body of, of events and people, or are we a government funded model? Um, primarily, you know, there's never one, one funding model. So that's, that's kind of core strategy. Another way that I, this is a model that's a little bit different. Um, La Piana is a national consultancy. And I really like how um, getting to the term business model. Some of you might, you know, um, it is a big term and it's interesting. I think it's used in a lot of different capacities. It's not used that often in the nonprofit space. You might hear funding model, you might need, hear business plan, but it's kind of a, a blend of, of um, mission and um, business plan, if you will. It's um, La Piana defines it as really the whole space of, um, in, in the who are we, which is uh, identity. When I do strategy with organizations, when they've really done this well, they really understand their core identity of who they are, what their business model is, what's their competitive advantage, then these next opportunities as they go about growth become so much easier because they're grounded in their core, core understanding of who we are, what we do, how we do it, and, and gen what we know, not that it's always stale because there's there are ways that you can create new, new funding streams, um, but every new funding stream is kind of like a, 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 a growth effort. It requires a lot of times you all know that there's the skills and the activities that go into a fundraising event are different than being able to write grants are different than being able to um, cultivate and secure uh, and grow major donors, right? So each new revenue stream also creates <laughs> creates a, a set of of work um, to do. So business model, who we are, what we do, how we how we do it, and how we finance it then an understanding of our competitive advantage, then using that to look at what, how does the, uh, a strategy screen play out? Now, if you're looking at a merger, for example, this identity um, in your values and your model and so forth should also be compared to that organization that you're trying to merge with um, in terms of fit. Uh, as well as, of course, the aspects of what a lot of times break that breaks down mergers is boards being able to merge, who's going to run the organization, leadership issues. But this is also very, very important when you think about uh, major collaborations, major partnering, um, and mergers. So um, I start with all that because I do see that as much as we're busy and we're day-to-day -day in our business, really um, significant sea change in terms of growth. Significant efforts usually do, um, are, are usually grounded in us knowing who we are, um, being able to um, articulate that and make sense of that as we go forward to pursue the right opportunities. Uh, I'm going to poll you just now to, to give me um, your sense of how well do you think your organization does understand these questions of who we are, what we do, and particularly how we do it and how we finance it. So if you wouldn't mind put, sending in chat your response to this. I like participation, so let's see if we can get a little more of this. Okay, we got... Yeah, must ministries pretty pretty good there. Five out of five. I'm not surprised. I've worked with must over the years. Okay. It looks like we're doing a little bit better on this. So that's a good foundation to build from. We're, you know, we're fours and fives, four and a half. Um, that's a good place to start. You know, if we're a four, um, how, where do we have, where do we have an opportunity to, to further create a shared um, understanding of our identity and our business model? So thank you for um, participating in that. And then, you know, moving from business model to um, value proposition, I just thought I would share um, a couple 
examples of what I see as pretty good um, in that first space of identity and understanding your identity to build a good base for then um, being able to pursue the right strategic opportunities. Um, many of you are hands up. Are many of you familiar with communities and schools models? Okay. Well, you know, they interestingly they were founded in Atlanta as kind of a one um, a local organization, but determined and saw that there was an opportunity to grow nationwide. So they they were the founder. Atlanta was the founder of communities and schools nations. They also have community schools of Georgia and some other regions. But this is their value proposition statement that. Um, you know, noting that they basically surround students with a community of support. That is their, that is their how, you know, their what and their how. That, that is their unique model. And they've, this is not perfect, and I'm sorry if it's not perfectly, but they have drawn it into a picture, graph, a good, powerful picture to really um, try to boil down um, organizations um, model sometimes can be very, very he helpful. Um, I've seen that work and you'll see in a minute with New American Pathways and others when particularly helpful when they're trying to grow and just take their organization to the next level and make it easier for people to understand. They might understand who they are, but it's hard for other people to understand who they are and how they're different. So, you know, they just, um, they have this picture of you know, how they, one, they have proven success because they do have all this evidence that they've generated um, both locally and national continues to support them and require their reporting and create this infrastructure of their evidence. They have this model of, of um, kind of targeting a set of individuals, but also providing school-wide support. And um, guess why that's important? They, they um, on the one hand, they're serving underserved kids. There's typically serving um, schools that are in greater need, but they are able to generate school-wide support because they're, um, they're providing some benefit to the school as a whole. And, and sure enough, a lot of their business model, about half of their business model of communities and schools of Atlanta is funded by the school systems itself. Um, but because they are bringing in the, the partners in the communities they also secure a lot of, uh, of grant, grants, foundation support, and some individual support. This is another picture from a New American Pathways. I worked with them when they were doing a merger. This was a major growth effort, a major, major project to extend their impact and also to make and create a, a, a more sustainable organization. There was Refugee Family Services that was, um, that was um, the only other local independent refugee serving organization. And then there was what was called RISA, um, resettlement. Um, and RISA was like subject to these like ups and downs of government funding, resettling refugees. Um, refugee Family Services was the one that came in after refugees were already settled in jobs, in housing. And so, um, and they happened to have a very nice, RISA had a mostly government funded model that was kind of up and down. Refugee Family Services had a more um, charitable model and a board and a capability that was more charitable. And they had this vision, um, they had the shared, shared values, shared vision of refugees being able to have safety and stability, success, self-sufficiency, and all the way to being, give, being able to become citizens and give back to the community and kind of put this into a picture as we were going through this merger together and a vision and have um, since used this to, uh, to really be able to tell their story and use it as a platform for growth. And it was very helpful as they were trying to bring these two organizations together and go out and they, they had a campaign of two or $3 million, including they got national growth. They, got, they were able to get a very competitive national growth grant because they had, did such a good job in, in being able to articulate their growth, um, why it made sense for them to grow, both in terms of the mission and the sustainable, strong organization that was at a greater scale that could, and that could sustain the ups and downs <laughs> and the uncertainties um, of, and you know, you know what happened during the Trump era, like completely decimating refugees. Um, they may not have survived if RISA was just an independent 
organization. So that's, that's just another example. Of course, tools that you can use. The one that I think is most relevant, frankly, um, well, a lot of these are, but mission versus money, really understanding our different programs and, and um, efforts uh, that we put in to run our organizations. And is there an opportunity, and I'll show you in a minute, where there's like high mission and relatively good money. <laughs> <laughs> is there something in the low mission, low money that people are just holding on to that we need to um, have a um, say, say goodbye to, you know, and have good hard discussion around saying goodbye or put some parameters around that. And then, of course, when you're doing a major, we all know that when you do like a capital campaign, a lot of times you do a feasibility study, but why should it just be capital campaign? You know, if you're if you want to do a growth campaign, you could also do a feasible study feasibility, which would usually come with the business plan and, and going out and getting input and or buy-in just like you would to a capital campaign for, for um, the feasibility of a project. This is the mission that versus money. How many of you have ever gone through an exercise? Put your hands up if you have tried to chart out your programs and or even like your major, for example, your major activities that you operate for. I mean, it's hard for people to say anything's low mission. But if you really force yourself to do this and you ask people to do it individually and then use it as a tool, I found it to be very useful to board members too because they just really struggle with how to understand nonprofit finance. Um, for them to be able to say, well, that new idea that you came up with board member, well, that's kind of in the low, <laughs> low mission, low, <laughs> um, low profitability um, chart. Okay. Stepping back from all that, so we've talked about um, core strategy, identity, um, some tools you can use to really build a strong foundation for growth. That's, you know, that's the key, strong foundation for sustainable growth um, and, um, and hopefully not being just opportunistic, but really understanding who you are and what fits and being able to, to more quickly in some cases say yes to things because it clearly fits and more quickly say no to other things. What, um, stepping back from all that, what are different scaling strategies um, for when you do have that business model uh, well understood? Of course, um, there's extending your existing program and services to new geographies. And I know Must Ministries has done that as, they, as they've gone to different cities and uh, opened up um, new locations for um, your stores and whatnot. Open Hand, of course, is an example of you know, going after new, um, in this case, they, they have both charitable and government contracts, securing new county uh, senior meal contracts, and ultimately having a vision of wanting to be statewide and how they could serve the state, knowing that if they could serve the state more, um, you know, across the state, maybe not every, you know, single community that they could get a, a statewide contract. Communities of schools of Georgia is always looking to open up new affiliates. And they actually have a really good um, process that they require local affiliates that was developed by national, of course, having a national organization take the time to develop process for going into new locations. Why do you, why do you think that's important? It's important because, you know, new locations, even for businesses can go south. It's a, it's a risky process because you still have to you still have to establish yourself. You might have a name, but you really probably don't have much of a name in that community with those people hiring, getting um, supporters, getting donors. So each new, it's not as simple as it may seem to go from one location to another. And so they have a process that they have when they go to a, a superintendent calls them up and says, we want you in Columbus, Georgia. Well, they're not just gonna to come to Columbus, Georgia, even if the superintendent and some major foundation calls, they will go and they will share with them what their process for becoming an affiliate is, which includes things like developing a champions council and what that champions council needs to do and such. Um, Grady Clinics is some, just an example of going to new locations that are convenient and where there's a demand and a hole. Um, another strategy is expanding your current programs, products or services, their depth or breadth. For example, you know, Open Hand um, has healthy, has a big kitchen. They did a major capital campaign to develop even a bigger first class kitchen with more freezer space, more. Um, and they believe that they could use that 
that infrastructure and that knowledge of good healthy meals to launch a uh, to launch a um, income generating good measure meals. So that was kind of leveraging their infrastructure, their expertise, um, you know, and they've done pretty well with it. But what one of the things that that um, you have to be careful too is the customer of the senior low income stay at home, even though there's the same meal, there's, there's different tastes, different um, meal plans, et cetera. So it's not always as simple. It is a different market, different customer segment. Anytime you have a different customer segment, usually there are some different needs in terms of the products and the capabilities and the, and the service. Um, then there's the major um, funder growth where you, a situation where you have a potential large infusion of funds Sometimes you do have to be open to, hey, there's this RFP out where um, Casey Foundation, for example, you know, that's very engaged in foster care and children and youth wants to see, um, or the federal government um, is typically, federal and or state governments come up with big, um, big new programs that they want to see um, grow and serve a, a need. So there's an opportunity for a large infusion of funds. So that's a situation where, again, if you just go back to the grounding of who we are and what our capabilities are, and you hopefully can bet, can also understand the adequacy of their funds and have some skills and expertise of how to put um, good grant applications that can fully fund your overhead. <laughs> um, and you have some capital in the bank because they pay slowly. <laughs> um, you know that the, the pros and cons of that kind of funding model you can, you know, for example, um, have some statewide expansion or expansion even your own market, or you can, um, you know, Healthcare Georgia likes to see, you know, um, opportunities to take quality healthcare to rural communities, for example, um, or you know, you might have a COVID grant. So that those are opportunities that many of you might have seen. And then, you know, there's new market services. Um, you know, GCN um, has, uh, is always looking for ways that it can um, come up with new opportunities to, to better serve or, or to come up with. Um, so, you know, there was a demand for more than advice, more than training, but explicit direct um, assistance through consulting or um, group based training where it's not, um, you know, where there's tools and um, outcomes that come with training. Um, so always looking for ways that we can take our capabilities and develop a new approach or a new product or a new service. Affiliation with a regional state or national organization. Some organizations ultimately either de disentangle themselves. Sometimes affiliates go independent or sometimes organizations say, hey, we this is too hard to stand on our own. Or we really do think that there's power in, in um, aligning ourselves. So KIPP schools is an example of a national charter school model that, you know, has a successful set of schools here in Atlanta. And when they grow and develop, they're able to get some growth capital and assistance from their national office, for example, as being part of that network. And they are able to leverage that national name and national reputation. Um, I, I'm noted must ministries, you know, going and I don't know what the trajectory of of your growth to different locations, but it seems like you've continued to expand in, in different locations uh, and maybe not always with if you have five different services, maybe you don't have five in every location or maybe you do. Um, but going to different locations in need where there's not a, a, a quality kind of scaled provider, um, a lot of smaller communities don't don't really have that, you know, you have a, a food pantry here at this church and you have a food pantry here, but um, acquisition or consolidation, some of, one of you mentioned that. Uh, I worked on, there was an opportunity that that uh, the, food, the food bank had a program called Kids in Need. Some of you might remember going there to get school supplies way back when, when you volunteered there. And they were looking to spin that program out and Empty Stocking Fund had, you know, a kind of one shot deal with just a holiday, um, you know, a major uh, important one shot program that was during the holiday period. And they thought it would make a lot of strategic sense to use warehousing, the fact that they know how to, to, to distribute goods um, efficiently to 
families a need to um, acquire that and bring that program out of the, the food bank. And in that process, um, we were able to negotiate with the food bank to become not only to let them have that program, but to finance some of its some of its success because they didn't want to kind of leave that gap in the market and to go out to some of the major um, donors and to work with Cox Curry to fund a campaign to make sure that there was a campaign for that um, addition to be successful. Uh, what are some of the barriers I already mentioned, um, but you know, gaining local champions is not is is not always so easy. You know, you know you know how hard you've worked to develop and cultivate your board, to develop and cultivate your community, to get your name out there in whatever geography and whatever community you are in now. Um, and you also know sometimes the the good and the bad of they call it the independent sector for a reason. Sometimes um, people don't want to be corporate. They want to have their own flavor in their own community. Um, businesses struggle with that too when they're trying to franchise their, you know, Chick Fil A is a company owned model, and not surprising you see consistency and quality across all of Chick Fil A's. And um, you know, you might not always see that with certain other. Um, corporate franchise operations. Of course, McDonald's is willing to, to do something different in France than it is in, um, in the US. Um, so there is some, some uh, room for ownership, but, but you know, there's um, th that challenge of, hey, we wanna do it our own way here in town. And you know, is this a right fit? Do, are you getting on board with our approach, our model, our requirements? You know, if you're gonna be part of our network or part of this, then we, we need to make sure we, have a local advisory board that's doing X and Y and um, kind of um, looking at that, that model, particularly when you're going to a new geography with a satellite or a, diff, um, a distinctive location that's not right around the corner um, from where you currently operate. Funding upfront cost um, is sometimes a barrier, but equally so is making sure you have the time. You know, it's it's not, usually um, that hard when you're a well-run organization, but it takes time to develop ongoing sustaining resources. So, so I recommend a lot of times you do a three-year um, plan and a campaign for how this program is gonna get to self-sustaining over time, if you, especially if you're a major funder wants to see that. Um, you know, just people risk, um, resource risk, um, being undersized, the communities and schools of Georgia had all these little affiliates all across the state, and they were usually a one-person team, you know, working, trying to run a whole communities and school in these small communities. And they decided that they um, were going to be, bring those small affiliates, the ones that wanted to come under their company umbrella, and therefore they could, they could become kind of an outsourced um, chief development officer for some of them, they they were able to manage that a little bit by having, they do have independent affiliates like Communities and Schools of Atlanta, as you probably could imagine, is an independent affiliate as part of the Communities and Schools of Georgia. They're robust, they're strong, they're self-sustaining, they've got adequate staff, but many of their places, including even, even Marietta, decided to come under their company model so that they could get the shared services of finance, HR, et cetera, that a small little undersized operation was not able to, to do on their own. And then there's just this issue of, of autonomy. I'm working with a national organization right now that's having its chapters fight with its national over mainly money, right? <laughs> um, okay. I'm gonna stop there for a minute. So what we've done just to kind of reflect We've talked about core strategy, grounding yourself, approaches to approaches to scaling and growing your impact and um, definitions of that, and then some barriers. Um, you know, I, I probably am a little bit biased, but I, I definitely believe that I don't think planning should be exhaustive. I think, um, but I do think that, you know, planning is not just putting something down on paper. It's engaging your stakeholders. It's generating um, like a good just like a good board development process is when you engage your board and and kind of having a voice, having a, having a chance to understand. So, you know, if you're going about growth planning, you you really do want to think about who are those key stakeholders and um, the data 
um, that could be helpful to us to help us make um, the right decisions. Sometimes it's some benchmarking. Like I just worked with an organization and I really challenged them to do some benchmarking because they um, honestly see themselves as fairly, um, they didn't necessarily, I think the board wanted to sort of um, take it to the next level. And there was, there's like, I think we're doing pretty well. We've grown, we've survived. But it was like, well, let's look at the benchmark. If our aspiration is to be, um, to really be the leader, let's look at what other organizations are doing and what their size and their growth trajectory is. And that was informative to them. And then really what, what are your, um, you know, what's your three-year plan? This is more broadly speaking, um, your growth plan and your strategic plan, but products and services, marketing partnerships, people, revenue, it needs to be holistic. Um, I'm not going to go through a lot of this, but, you know, a good plan um, kind of, it looks holistically at the products, services, people, resources, going back to core strategy. It all has to and then, you know, at the end of the day, like, what are the, um, what's, what do we need to do? What's the milestone plan? What needs to come first and who's doing what and making sure people um, there's ownership and enthusiasm and support for those people that have the lead and a process for following that and reviewing that. So um, how ready do we feel now for, uh, for scaling as it relates to you know, our, our, um, just our sense of, of where we are as an org organization and even frankly, organizational health. I mean, a lot of organizations have suffered through, um, COVID are, are down on staff, not fully staffed. And so that's, that's an aspect that I didn't mention, just like, you know, um, sometimes you might get ahead of yourself on the one hand you want to push, but you also want to recognize what the, where the where the sentiment of of the team is, market mission impact management money, is anybody um, you know want to comment? Greg, I've seen you kind of nod your head a good good bit on any of this. Anybody you want to comment on any aspect of scaling that you um, you've been through that at at Must, you know, in different geographies and are still pursuing it, you know, uh, any any experience you want to share with this group? Well, we, we have, and, and, and we continue. Um, I, I put in the chat, the mobile pantry was probably our most recent uh, effort to do that, um, <clears throat> where we have a mobile bus that now goes to 16 different locations in five different counties. And, um, you know, it required uh, a capital investment. It required um, planning. Uh, it has absolutely scaled beyond what we originally envisioned. So you have to be ready for that scale to, um, to, to, to grow um, and maybe not necessarily be able to anticipate what that's going to look like. Um, yeah, and yeah. you're not going to always have the crystal ball, right? You have to be oh, flexible right. along the way. And, and the program has, and that particular program has, has expanded and contracted over time. Um, mm -hmm. As, as you, you go into an area and you realize, okay, this is, this is not really where we're needed most. And so you, you pick a different area, but um uh, the neighborhood pantry program, it's now 31 pantries in schools. And so, you know, that's a great example of where we can partner, where we don't need, uh, we don't need the brick and mortar. We just need the transportation logistics. And so that, that partnership really, I think, uh, for us is where we see the future uh, to be able to um, expand geographically into areas uh, without necessarily uh, standing up brick and mortar, uh, finding, finding, partners that know their community better than we do uh, and finding ways that we can come alongside uh, either with intellectual property we have that they don't, that we can share, um, or in some cases just uh, enhance what they're already doing. So we're, we're actually right in the middle of a, of a three to five year strategic plan as we speak. Planning. Great. Yeah. I mean, um, I, I think in the absence of developing your own local buy-in, support, expertise, reputation, um, you know, uh, strategic partnering for growth and collaborative and really kind of figuring out what, what your lane is and how you can um, complement somebody else. I mean, you know, that is, that really is um, a great model and one that allows so many organizations um, want to have um, grand impact, but yet 
they're only like doing two out of the five pieces of the puzzle. And so, so one right way to recognize that gap in your, your initial like understanding of what, what outcomes you want to uh, get is to recognize, well, we're only serving kindergartners and first graders, and we're saying we want them to get to college successful. We better either build the whole system all the way through, through high school or find a way to, to partner. <laughs> um, so, you know, if we, we do certain things really, really well, and it, even businesses get themselves in trouble if they just keep extending themselves to new areas of capabilities and beyond the scope of, of what they can do well. Um, so that partner-based model and collaborative model and using leveraging the community and their assets and their infrastructure is, is definitely um, an important aspect of the strategy. Good, thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm going to spend just a little bit of time. How many of you have ever been introduced to this concept of um, a nonprofit funding model? Like, have you ever heard of, you know, you, you might, anybody like, it may sound like a big buzzword, but the, the Stanford um, Social Innovation Review in looking at the, particularly the larger nonprofits that were um, tens of millions of dollars and beyond. Um, went and did a study of those organizations, their type, their attributes, their funding model, and used that to, um, you know, in, in the software space, there's something called, um, uh, you know, there's different, there's, there's complex um, software sales, and then there's, um, you know, that there's a free, freeware model, right? There's freeware, there's different models out there for software that um, software industry knows. A nonprofit, um, Bridge Bridgepan worked on this too. Um, there are non nonprofit funding models when um, it explains um, whether you know it or not. Um, your nonprofit gener generates a certain type of revenue a little bit more easily based on its its at attributes, it, the space that it sits in, um, and and you know it can change over time. But if you know what that model is it can help you to pursue it more aggressively as opposed to saying we, you know, the, um, the favorite thing I hear of board members is we just need to get co corporate money. <laughs> that's, um, that's the cliche. And yes, corporate models fit a junior achievement fairly well because one, they put all their CEOs and, and senior VPs on their board um, very well. And two, they have a really w effective way to tie in their mission to business mission of developing leaders of the future, going into the classroom, engaging corporate volunteers. And so they have a nice corporate model um, for a lot of reasons. Um, you, you probably have one, one or two predominant income streams that, that work well for you. So this is the, and I, and I have the resource later that I can point you to, but they came up with this idea of 10 nonprofit funding models. And this is predominant with the, the scaled organizations. I would say that smaller to mid-sized organizations, most of which even Mess Ministries is on the mid-size, not the super large um, size that, you know, it, it may not be as simple as this, that you do tend to have a little bit more um, diverse funding models, but this is a, a um, description of, there's 10 different fun funding models. So a heartfelt connector would be like a Save the Children or a Susan G. Komen, where almost everybody, um, if there's a broad appeal, almost everybody knows a mother or an aunt or a grandmother or a sister that has um, experienced breast cancer. And so they're able to appeal to a broad um, base of funders. And so they can have, they predominantly can do special events. Uh, direct mail and corporate sponsor sponsorships, guess what? Because there's a lot of people who um, will engage with this cause actively. And so that's kind of a marketing tool for, for businesses. A beneficiary builder would be like a school or a university where there's direct beneficiaries from your service. Um, or maybe if you serve both high-income people and low-income people, you can charge the high-income people for your service and subsidize um, but it's usually places, uh, universities, private schools, et cetera. I'm not gonna go through all this, but suffice it to say that there's also a way that you can go back and look at your business model and say, 
what can we learn from our current approach to funding? What have we learned? You know, what have we stepped back from all that? And, you know, I'm sure many of you do do your fundraising plan, fundraising assessments, but um, really have you kind of asked yourself what, what type of model may be our predominant model? I mean, are we in a space where, um, go, going back to mess ministries, um, resource recyclers, some degree you, you, you can use excess goods and or donated goods available from an efficient economy. So you, 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 this is not the only thing you do at must, but you do get a lot of in-kind giving um, because government has surplus food. People want to bring food. Um, so that's just an example. So what can we learn from our peers? Have we studied our peers in the market for what their funding model looks like and what opportunities that might point to? And then as you look to grow, um, you can look at generally, and then of course the type of growth you want to pursue may affect that. So if it's major growth, um, you're, you're going to typically need to have to go to major donors, right? To get you started. Um, the big foundations and or um, your big major foundation funders that can write a $10,000 or $25,000 check and, and do a campaign. And then you move forward to select where you're going to invest. For example, you might identify that, hey, we have some major donors and we think we have a major donor um, model that can work, but we've really never invested in a, a, a major donor campaign or we've never written a major donor plan or we haven't figured out how to do that. We haven't engaged our board in that. And that's where we think we have the opportunity to grow, for example. So um, I'm kind of at the end of the formal part of the workshop. What I um, would like to do is to stop and just um, have Q and A um, for anybody. I, I think we have a session on Thursday too, I believe. Um, for following up on questions as well. But I wanna stop here for, for Q&A, but I also want to invite um, anybody who would be willing to share what one or two, you know, what what any one action or learning have they taken away that they might wanna put, put to work. Um, you know, adult learning is about, you know, listening, but really kind of putting it into action. So um, Q, any Q questions or anybody wanna share what, what one action or, or learning takeaway that they want to put to work? <laughs>